بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمه الله الحمد لله this is our third podcast and i want to first just welcome and congratulate everybody on their ramadan and this is a time allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed this ummah in particular with an adherence to their tradition that hasn't diverted or deviated. And so Muslims are fasting all over the world between the daylight hours. It's a great blessing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the reward of that. First thing I wanted to talk about was inflammation. Inflammation is a response of the body. And when you have a foreign invasion of protein or even like a sliver will cause some slight inflammation. So inflammation is actually a healthy response from the body uh, to something that's threatening uh, the integrity of the body. But what happens when the integrity gets overwhelmed is the inflammation can actually do the opposite. Instead of actually helping the body, it actually starts killing the body. The, the Arabic word for uh, tribulations that occur in societies is fitna. And fitna is like, a, it's like an inflammation of the social body. So when you have, for instance, I'll give you an example. If you remember the cartoons in Denmark, the cartoons are still there. They're on the website. They're probably more widespread than they were at the outset. But is anybody jumping up and down? Is anybody uh, tearing anything down? Is anybody screaming and shouting? No, because the, the inflammation has subsided. The fitna has subsided. And so one of the natures of fitna is that you have to be aware of it and what it is so that you react appropriately. You understand what it is. If you allow it to take over, it's a disaster. And that's why there's so many verses in the Quran about being patient, about being forbearing, about recognizing. The Quran says that you will hear from the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, and, and the polytheist, much harm. You'll hear things that are really bothering you. You know, you'll hear much harm. And then it says, but if you're patient and you adhere to taqwa, to this piety, that is the essence of this matter. In other words, the actual exciting factor is a test to your social body, how you respond. Do you allow it to create a septicemia that actually destroys your body? So your own response is what destroys the body. Or do you isolate it and are able to contain it? And so your inflammation is measured. Because you have to respond if you're, if you're human. There has to be some response. But what type of response? Is it a beneficial response or is it a harmful response? That's the real question. So we've had all these fitness, just one after another. And they line them up. And what's amazing to me is what I see happening is a lot of this is in fact instigation. Wittingly or unwittingly, I'm not going to get into the hearts of people, but that's what, in essence, that's what's happening. People are being instigated. But they fall right into it. And it's, it's about time the Muslims wised up. Really. It's about time they really started thinking a little deeper about what's going on, about how we address these issues. So what I wanted to talk about a little bit is what I'll call broadening the scope of the Pope. Uh, one of the recent major issues, fitna, that happened is the Pope made some remarks and then suddenly everybody's up in arms. Well, the reality of it is not everybody was up in arms. In fact, a very small group of people were up in arms, usually hooligans. Like in, in this country, if you have somebody, we had recently a sniper went down to a mosque and shot at, at uh, Muslims praying tarawih at night. So, 
in the Middle East, there weren't all these papers, Americans attacking mosques. It was an isolated incident. That's all it was. It was an isolated incident. It's evil and it should be dealt with and, and we hope that the proper authorities take it seriously and do that. But my point is, is that you don't blow that out of proportion to make it like every American is threatening the well-being and safety of Muslims. Because that's not the case. We're, we're living here. I'm living here. You're living here. We're in America. And we're generally as secure as you can be in America. I mean, we get hassled at the airports and, and things like that. But generally, people walking around, you're not going to have somebody attacking you. Some of our women, unfortunately, get some looks that aren't pleasant. Not from everybody, some, from some people. There's ignorant people everywhere. My point is, is that when, when this idea that the whole Muslim world blew up at the statements of the Pope, no, people in, in Jeddah or Cairo, they're drinking their tea and Ish fil Baba, whatever, you know. I mean, they'll make comments over the, the breakfast table or something like that, but they're not out destroying the Coptic churches or, or going crazy, and their Christian friends are still their Christian friends. And that's why it was very beautiful the response of Ignatius IV, who's the patriarch of Antioch, and we put his letter up on the Zaytuna website. And the reason we put that letter up there was because we felt that it was a beautiful Christian response. And what he basically said is, look, we've lived with the Muslims for centuries in mutual respect, and, and that's something the Pope needs to ask himself, you see. Because Muslims are in Europe now, but they're not historical communities. Whereas Christians are in the Muslim world as historical, unbroken communities since the time of Christ. How is that possible if it wasn't for Muslim tolerance? So I want to look here at uh, something that, and I'm, I'm not going to quote from Muslims because people can say, oh, well, they're just biased. This is Montgomery Watt, who's a Christian, uh, but a, a fair, I think, reasonably fair scholar. And one of the things he talks about is this, the distortion of the image of Islam among Europeans. And he talks about how Europeans use this, this is a war of light and darkness. So he comments, the war of light and darkness sounds well, but in this post-Freudian world, men realize that the darkness ascribed to one's enemies is a projection of the darkness in oneself that is not fully admitted. So, in this way, the distorted image of Islam is to be regarded as a projection of the shadow side of European man. The distorted image of Islam is to be regarded, right, as a shadow side of European man. I mean, that's a, to me, that's a profound... Hon I love honesty. I love unbiased people. I love people that are disinterested, that are able to just call a spade a spade and tell it like it is. I like people like that, that don't waffle over things, that don't prevaricate, that don't dissemble, that don't lie, that don't speak with a forked tongue. Just be fair and upright. If it's against you, say, you know what? I'm clearly in the wrong. Somebody called me on something the other day. I said, you're absolutely right. I don't want to get defensive. And if I get defensive, because we're human, I like to, to look at that. Okay, why am I getting defensive? Is this getting a little close to the truth here? You know, why is this irking me? Why is this vexing me? I have to ask that question. So when, when Montgomery Watts says that this is a projection, onto the other. That's a man who's, who's a Christian and a committed Christian, but who spent his life studying Islam. So what he's saying is, we need to look a little deeper here. So I want to look a little bit at the Pope's address, because I think this is a case of the pot calling the kettle black. Right. Now the Pope, this was a university address. It was, in, interestingly enough, entitled Faith, Reason, and the university, memories and reflections. So he's remembering what his experience was. And he's obviously, I read the, the paper in its entirety. He, he's a very intelligent man. He, 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 apparently he loves Goethe. He's an accomplished pianist. Anyway, 
in this talk, he, he's talking about faith and reason. Very interesting subject. But in the talk, he brings up, he said, I'd like to bring up a conversation that occurred somewhere during the siege of Constantinople. This is very important because he's using a historical reference to a very significant event in European history, even though technically, and Constantinople is bridging Europe and Asia. But he brings up this so-called debate between Manuel II, who was a, considered to be a very brilliant Byzantine emperor, and this Persian scholar that we don't know who it is. So, in this seventh conversation, in a newly edited book by Professor Khouri, the emperor touches on the theme of the holy war. The emperor must have known that Surah 2, verse 26, 256, reads, there is no compulsion in religion. According to the experts, this is one of the surahs of the early period. Which experts? It's not a surah of the early period. Baqarah is one of the later surahs. Now, what he says is, Muhammad was still powerless and under threat. But naturally, the emperor also knew the instructions developed later and recorded in the Quran concerning holy war. So this, what he's indicating here is when he was powerless and weakness, he said there's no coercion in religion. Well, that's very interesting because there's no meaning to that verse if you're powerless. How do you coerce somebody if you don't have power? So why would he even say that? There's no coercion in the religion if he's powerless to coerce anybody into the religion. I mean, that verse is applied verse. There are, there are scholars that say that the verse is abrogated. There are scholars that say that, and I, and I don't deny that, because I like calling it fair. But they have been rejected by the overwhelming body of Muslims throughout the, the, the centuries of Islam. So there are some scholars that that verse is, was abrogated by the, what's called ayat al saif But all of the ulama are in agreement. And what they mean is, if you're in state power, you can force people to pay zakat if they're not paying zakat. But nobody's ever said you can force a non-Muslim to embrace Islam in the history of Islam. Nobody has ever abrogated the verse from that meaning in the history of Islam. But what they mean is you can use course of power in a state to, to implement the religion, but not to force anybody to follow the religion. Nobody has ever said that in the history of Islam. So I don't know which experts he's relying on to give him that information because it's not uh, correct information. So then he goes on to say, that this Manuel says, quote, show me just what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't say that, but I'm saying that, brought that was new. And there you will find things only evil and inhuman, such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. You show me where the Prophet Muhammad said, spread this faith by the sword. Show me one verse, one hadith, just show it to me. Where he said, force people to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. There's no verse that says that. And the one hadith in which the Prophet said, Umirtu an uqatil anas hatta an yashhadu an la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That verse is about specifically the people in Mecca, that the Nas there are his own people, the Quraysh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him permission to fight them because they persecuted him, and they had a choice either to leave or to accept Islam. That was their choice. But, so that exists. And I, like I said, I wanna, I'm not going to waffle. I don't want to, you know, there's a lot of Muslim apologists out there that will pretend like there aren't these things in and they get up and have their interfaith dialogues and things like that and don't talk about these. No, these things are there. But they're there in Christianity. If you want, I've read St. Thomas Aquinas. You read St. Thomas Aquinas about what he says to do to people that aren't following the proper faith because it's a capital offense, according to St. Thomas Aquinas. And he is still the greatest authority. In fact, this, this talk is largely based on the work of St. Thomas Aquinas. So, and I can give you quotes from St. Thomas Aquinas to show that. But my point is, is that he goes on to quote this, and then one of the major problems for me is that he doesn't, he doesn't say, this is a medieval, yes, he says, I quote. But he doesn't say anything about the quote. He just leaves it like it is. Well, I have a problem with that. 
Tell us what you think about that quote. I mean, he's later said this, that, or the other. But I want to look at who Manuel II is, all right? Because I, I, now I was originally Orthodox. So the, 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 and I was a serious Orthodox. I was, I was, you know, altar boy in an Orthodox church. I went to Greece when I was uh, young to be in an Orthodox summer camp to learn about the religion, visited all the sites. But Constantinople, Istanbul, Constantinople is the center of Orthodox Christianity, the New Rome. And I just recently, for the first time, visited the Hagia Sophia, which is an amazing mosque, uh, church. I mean, it's just stunning. Really overwhelmed me to go in there. But when the Muslims conquered Constantinople, it's important to remember, they ruled Greece for over 400 years. The Parthenon was used as a mosque for 70 years in Greece. The Greeks are still Orthodox. Turks didn't force them to become. They're still an Orthodox Christian community. The Patriarch is still there in Istanbul. Where are the Sicilian Muslims? The Muslims were in Sicily for 300 years. Where are those Muslims? Where are the Spanish Muslims that were in Granada in 1492? when Granada was lost to the Catholic Church. Where are all the historical Muslim communities? They don't exist. So when you say coercion and forcing, and, and then you're going to quote from, from somebody from the Middle Ages to, to buttress your opinion, I don't know, I, that trouble. But let's look at, at Manuel II. Manuel II, from 1400 to 1403, the Byzantine emperor himself was touring the power centers of the West in hopes of drumming up money and support against the Muslims. So why is he quoting from somebody who's noted historically to be a man who toured the European nations to drum up support against the Muslims? In fact, he arrived in Venice in April 1400, shortly after uh, Chrysoloris had left Florence. From there, Manuel II went to Padua, uh, Vicenza, Pavia, Milan, where he and Chrysoloris celebrated their reunion. He goes on, he went to Paris. He spent a year with King Charles VI. He went to London. He was a big hit in the English capital where King Henry IV and his subjects gave him a magnificent reception, and on and on. So why is it that he's quoting from somebody who went around Europe to drum up support against the Muslims out of fear of the Muslims. I mean, that's, that to me, that's significant. That's something to think about. And he ends the quote with Manuel. He ends the, his whole talk with Manuel II. So why is he bringing up this historical character who was the last serious Byzantine emperor that was trying to stop the encroachment of the Muslims on what was left of the Byzantine Emperor. Now the Arabs have a saying, a Rome in lam yagzu, uh, in lam uh, The Byzantines are such, if you don't fight them, they fight you. So that during that period, that was just what was going on. That's the, that's the pre-modern world, and we have to accept that. That is the pre-modern world. That's the way pre-modern peoples are. They, they, they were fighting over territories, they were very different from uh, the modern people who don't fight over territories and, and natural resources and things like that. I mean, we're enlightened, civilized people. We don't resort to violence as a way of achieving our aims and objectives, right? So that's a distinct difference between the two. But anyway, that was the pre-modern world. So it's very important for people to think about what, what this means. Now, the irony of ironies, to me, in the whole talk, is what he's saying is faith and reason are compatible. Where did that idea come from? The fact that he quotes and tells us that Islam gave nothing good. He quotes a man who says Islam brought nothing good, only evil. Well, that idea of the compatibility of faith and reason comes from, in the Catholic Church, from St. Thomas Aquinas. Because before St. Thomas Aquinas, Tertullian and others, the theologians of the Catholic Church, did not have a reconciliation of faith and reason. You believe because it was absurd. It was a super rational uh, reality. What St. Thomas Aquinas did was he reconciled between faith and reason. Well, where did St. Thomas Aquinas get that idea of reconciling between faith and reason? Well, that's very interesting. 
If you look at the Cambridge Companion to Aquinas, on the chapter Aquinas and Islamic and Jewish thinkers, they give you a very accurate historical presentation of the fact that St. Thomas Aquinas was heavily influenced by Ibn Rushd, a Verawis, the Muslim philosopher. <laughs> So, if you look here, uh, the influence of Farabi exerted on medieval writers can be seen by a study of the work of Albertus Magnus, 13th century theologian, philosopher, and teacher. St. Thomas Aquinas was among those who attended Albertus' lectures. So, Albertus, St. Thomas Aquinas made it his goal, made it the goal, Albertus Magnus and St. Thomas Aquinas, and this is from Eugene Myers, Arabic Thought and the Western World, all right? Listen to this quote, Albertus Magnus and St. Thomas Aquinas made it the goal of their lives to reconcile Aristotelian and Muslim philosophy with Christian theology. Now, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, is that is the adopted philosophy of the Catholic Church and he was heavily influenced by I mean I you know I didn't make this stuff up I you know if the Pope needs some book references I can give him some good book references but I didn't make this stuff up so to end this is Montgomery Watt again when one keeps hold of all the facets of the medieval confrontation of Christianity Islam and Islam, it is clear that the influence of Islam on Western Christendom is greater than is usually realized. Not merely did Islam share with Western Europe many material products and technological discoveries, not merely did it stimulate Europe intellectually in the fields of science and philosophy, but it provoked Europe into forming a new image of itself. Because Europe was reacting against Islam, it belittled the influence of the Saracens and exaggerated its dependence on its Greek and Roman heritage. That's exactly what this, this talk was about, is how Greece is, this is our heritage. Totally rejecting any contribution of Islam. And in this 21st century, for a pope to do that is a grave disservice to interdependence, to harmony, to mutual respect, to an ability to live together, to actually appreciate and respect the various contributions. Europe has made immense contributions to human civilization. But to, to completely deny the contributions of the Muslim world and ultimately of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. So that's what he says. Be he says, so today an important task for Western Europeans as we move into the era of the one world is to correct this false emphasis and to acknowledge fully our debt to the Arab and Islamic world. That's a Christian who's, who's fair and unbiased. And that's all we're asking of the Pope. And I miss John Paul II. Because he was reaching out, he kissed the Qur'an. You know, when he was in Syria, he kissed the Qur'an, and, and they gave him flack for that. But that was just an act, it was a charitable act. Charity comes from caritas, which means love. It's interesting that the Pope talked about love in that talk. There was, I didn't see much love towards the Muslims. And, and the average person doesn't have to love us, but Christ said, love your enemies. So even if you see us as enemies, Christ commanded you to love us. Dostoevsky said there's, there's, the, the, the reason that that's such a powerful injunction is because it's easy to love your friends. Anybody can do that. I mean, a dog loves his master. But to really reach out with an open heart to people that m might not be like you or think like you or see like you. So I would just say to Muslims, we have to think at a deeper level. The Quran tells us to be patient. The Qur'an tells it, we're going to hear things, but we need to explain to them who we are, what we are, what we're about, what our religion is about. We need to behave like the Prophet Muhammad We need to take up his sunnah. And the Prophet was a gentle soul. He was, some, he was halim. He was forbearing. He was meek. He was a lion in battle. And that's undeniable. 
But when the battle ended, the largesse he always showed the people he conquered brought them to tears. That's why they became Muslim. He fought those who fought him, and he was given that permission. He was never aggressive, not an aggressive person. He was never vengeful. So I think it's very important that Muslims really think at a deeper level. But I'll, I'll end this by saying, Europe's in a crisis, and the Pope's very well aware of that crisis. is a crisis of identity. Who are we as Europeans? Well, there's a historical fact. And the fact is that Europe's identity, historically, is, revolves around two essential facts. The first is that they were Christian. So they have a Christian identity. The second is that their, their serious threat and enemy was Islam. That's Christian identity. Now, they're in a post-Christian era, so how do they maintain their identity? Well, the other historical cohesive factor in their history is an antipathy towards Islam. If they want to do that as a way of trying to congeal their society and hold it together, it's a failed project. The Muslims aren't at the gates of Vienna. They're treating your children. They're your pediatrician. They're the green grocer down the road. They're picking you up at the airport. The guy in the taxi, that guy right there, Abdul, he's a Muslim. He's not going to hurt you. He'll take you to where you're going, hope to get a tip from you. They're, they're the curry houses of London. That's where English people, if they want a good meal, they go to curry houses in London. Those are Muslims. They're not poisoning your food. They're not threatening your existence. Those are Muslims. So we need to live together. We're here, and we're here to stay. The world's not getting any, any bigger. May Allah guide us all to what's right and true, and may Allah bless our Ramadan, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.